When people say that neither politics or religion should ever be brought up as entertaining dinner party topics of conversation, it's because even amongst the most like-minded group of people, heated arguments inevitably arise. You could also add dog training to this list of contentious issues, because particularly where canine enthusiasts are concerned, there are 101 opinions dogmatically voiced on how it should be done. Thankfully, however, those who believe that dog training classes should find owners and their pets being regimentally drilled like soldiers are now in a minority, and a far more relaxed approach is much preferred. No longer are owners stigmatised for experiencing difficulties with their dogs. The old saying, there are no bad dogs, only bad owners, is simply untrue. A popular myth, in fact, that's long since been dispelled. Kindness with reward-based training now prevails, and such a cruel anachronism as the choke chain has been replaced by gentler and altogether more successful dog training methods. A major contributor to this more enlightened school of thought has been John Fisher, a pet behaviour counsellor who's responsible for pioneering many new dog handling techniques and, along with other like-minded professionals, formed the Association of Pet Dog Trainers. Today, if you're looking for a dog training class, finding an APDT-approved instructor will ensure that you'll be taught how to work kindly with your dog to get the best possible results, laying down the essential foundations for enjoying a very happy life with your pet. Sadly, John Fisher is no longer with us and his sudden death robbed the dog training world of a great, great treasure. We're here at the very picturesque Hartbury College in Gloucestershire. <laughs> Try <again. laughs> Gloucestershire. His softly spoken expertise, innate good sense and beguiling sense of humour helped to persuade people that there was a better way to shape their dog's behaviour in line with the modern family social requirements. The John Fisher way involves looking at all aspects of training from the dog's point of view and by encouraging owners to develop an understanding of what motivates their pet, all the usual doggy problems can be simply and calmly overcome or, better still, avoided altogether. Fortunately, the legacy of John Fisher lives on thanks to his wide range of published material continuing to give pet dog owners invaluable advice and guidance on how to live harmoniously with their animals. This programme is without doubt a tribute to John Fisher, but perhaps even more importantly, it's been designed to bring together all the best examples of the great man in action, with a full and clear explanation of the philosophy behind his groundbreaking training techniques. Consequently, you'll find everything that you need in this film to get you started with your pet dog's canine education, establishing acceptable standards of behaviour from day one.
It might seem hard to take on board the fact that these cute, lovable bundles of fluff are actually descended from the wolf. But you'd better believe it, because this is fundamental to understanding what makes any dog tick. Wolves are pack animals with a very defined social hierarchy and behaviour patterns, geared towards group survival, and the genetic blueprint that governs puppy behaviour is a definite throwback to this ancestry. A wolf pack will always have a leader, with all the other animals taking subordinate roles. The higher the status, the greater the privileges afforded, and this is how each member of the pack will judge his own position. Such survival requirements as food and somewhere warm and safe to sleep are paramount, which is why even the most docile of pet dogs can get pretty aggressive about any kind of intervention in these areas. It's genetically set in stone that any dog will try at all times to improve his position within the pack. If, for example, he's able to occupy a prime sleeping position and his pack allows him to do so, his status must be high ranking. You must remember that exactly the same principles apply in your home. If you let your puppy sleep in the prime spot on the settee, he'll think that he's a very high ranking member of your human pack. When he's small, it might not be too much of a problem to remove him when you want to sit and watch your favourite television programme. But as he grows, life will become very much more difficult, as he'll turn to aggression to defend not only a comfy place to sleep, but also his perceived pack status. By understanding this inbuilt character trait within your dog, it's possible to ensure that such key behavioural elements do not give your pet the wrong idea. See your actions as an owner from your dog's point of view, and ask yourself what message you're sending with every step you take. If you feed your dog before the rest of the family sits down to eat in the evening, in wolf terms, you're telling him that he's the most important individual in your household. From a human perspective, you may, perfectly logically, think you're avoiding your dog being a menace begging for food at your table, whereas in fact, you are inadvertently giving yourself a much bigger problem to deal with, as your dog will see himself as higher ranking than you. Try then to get him to obey a simple come, sit or stay command and he'll soon let you know what he thinks of your right to lead his pack. But don't panic, you don't need to become a dog psychologist to avoid getting your wires crossed. This programme will take you through all the simple techniques you can use to prevent such conflicts from arising. Having grasped the principles of thinking from the dog's point of view as a pack animal, let's go right back to the beginning and apply the theory to the practical task of selecting a pet dog. Now, For the purpose of this programme, we'll be looking at introducing a puppy to your home. However, if you're thinking about taking a rescue or an older dog, the same straightforward training methods can be applied with equal success. 
but you do have to make allowances for any bad habits that may have already become established. Choosing the right breed of dog for your lifestyle is very important. And particularly when you're looking at puppies, it's all too easy to fall in love with a little fluffy animal without taking on board what he's likely to grow into. If your space is limited, make sure you at least see a fully grown version of your chosen pet before committing. But size, as they say, isn't everything. And when it comes to finding your perfect pooch, it couldn't be more true. Returning to the topic of genetic blueprints, we need to focus next on breed-specific behaviour. If you choose a collie just because you have no sheep to herd, it doesn't mean that your dog will automatically be able to suppress his inbuilt desire to round up anything that moves. Unfortunately, if you have small children in close proximity, they'll make perfect sheep substitutes. A quick nip to a wayward sheep's ankles is perfectly acceptable in a working farm environment. But if it's your next door neighbour's youngsters, or pedigree Persian cat being targeted, you're going to have problems. In this situation, the dog is not misbehaving. He's running with his instincts, and you are taking on the whole of his ancestry when you try to stop him doing what comes naturally. So ask yourself, what is this animal I am considering taking into my home pre-programmed to do? If it's a herding type, like a collie or a German Shepherd, make sure you can cope with the instinct to herd. Also, this type of dog has been bred to work and has a lot of energy and is very alert. John Fisher was well known for saying that if you didn't give a collie a job, he'd go self-employed. And it's worth remembering these words of wisdom. If you can offer these dogs plenty of exercise and play games to satisfy his frustrated herding instincts, then you'll be fine. If long walks and a pet with such a lively nature prove inappropriate, if, say, you have limited mobility, then the herding types are best avoided. Labradors and Golden Retrievers are classic gun dog types and are often described as the clowns of the dog world, revelling in their owner's amused attention. They will also do pretty much anything you ask for food, making them a delight when it comes to reward-based training, and their gentle nature makes them an ideal pet for anyone with a young family. Bred in ages past to fetch the huntsman's prey, there's nothing this type of dog likes better than carrying things around in its mouth, and so long as you are aware of this, you won't have a problem. A dog doesn't know the difference between a chew toy and your wallet, and constantly shouting, drop it, bad dog, will do nothing for a harmonious relationship. It's really straightforward to make your life easier with just two simple actions. Firstly, Put anything you don't want your dog to pick up and carry off out of reach. And secondly, play plenty of games to satisfy this instinct. Fetch it. Good dog is far better than chastisement, and you'll end up with having a great time yourself, building a lifelong bond with your pet. If you're choosing a dog for security purposes, there are plenty of guarding types to consider. But even if this is why you want your dog, you must be prepared for some complex behaviour traits. By nature, a dog that guards is going to be territorial. And as an owner, you'll really need to be leader of your pack 
to counter any problems of aggression that might arise. If your dog is happy with you, well socialised and rewarded with plenty of play, toys seem particularly appealing to this type of dog. You'll have one of the loyalist pets anybody could ask for. However, get it wrong with the guarding breed and the results can be catastrophic for owner, dog and any innocent bystander who happens to encroach upon the animal's perceived territory. Mention terriers and people tend to think of snappy little aggressive dogs and, quite truthfully, they can be if not handled properly. Historically, they've been bred for hunting pretty fierce prey and, as John Fisher often said, a terrier will act first and think later. In their genetic makeup, it was a matter of life or death to fight aggressively and although today's domestic demands are minor in comparison, the ancestry will cause, to say the very least, a degree of overreaction. Here you see a Jack Russell acting out of all proportion to the threat of a visitor. And as an owner, if you pick a terrier breed, you'll need to socialise your pet with great care to avoid this kind of behaviour. The last category is the hound type, including beagles, dachshunds, greyhounds, lurchers and afghans. When you go up to your local park, where plenty of dogs are enjoying supervised freedom, you'll rarely see a hound type off the lead. Highly sensitive and prepared to give chase at the slightest provocation, these animals are pretty speedy, so you'll benefit from being fairly fit yourself if a hound type is your choice. You must also be aware that hound types, no matter how well trained, should never be allowed off the lead near livestock. The instinct to chase is just too strong and it's not worth taking a chance. Also make sure you introduce hound types to smaller family pets with the greatest of care because your much loved rabbit will be a tempting lure if ever the opportunity to give chase arises. It could well be that the dog you're considering doesn't actually fit into any of these categories and if so, you'll need to do a bit of detective work to help you devise a suitable training strategy. However, the same principles apply, you just have a slightly more difficult task. Remember, don't work against the gene pool if you can possibly avoid it. Evolution is a stronger influence than you are. Choose a breed of dog that's appropriate to your circumstances and then you won't be constantly preventing your pet from behaving as nature intended. Take your time to think this all through and bear in mind the fact that you might have to wait a while for the right puppy or dog to come along.
Talking to your local vet's practice, even at this early stage, is a very good idea, as they'll be able to recommend reputable breeders and animal shelters in your area. Also, you can check out the required vaccinations as these vary regionally, and perhaps look at a pet insurance plan to cover future medical costs. It may sound a little premature to find a vet at this stage, but it's really important because trying to choose one when you have a sick animal to cope with is horribly stressful. And a familiar face at the vet surgery will make any situation much easier to cope with. Here you see a superb example of a modern practice, which not only offers the best of care, it also has a shop selling everything that you'll need to buy for your dog throughout his life with all items approved and recommended by the people who really know what's best. By the time you bring your puppy home, you'll already be at a distinct advantage, having started to think of yourself as leader of your human pack, as this will instantly make your new pet feel safe and secure. Wherever your puppy is coming from, Leave a blanket with him for a few weeks before collection, so it'll smell of his mother and his litter mates to help him through the first few days in a new environment. Most owners will collect their puppy at eight weeks old, and do make sure that you get to see the entire litter with mum, if at all possible. You can tell a lot about any given puppy's temperament from seeing them in this way and make your choice accordingly. Here are a few tips to help you avoid the most common misconceptions when you scrutinise this behaviour from the dog's point of view. The puppy that rushes up to you may seem a friendly little chap, but be very careful. This outgoing behaviour is actually a sign of dominance because he's demanding the right to be the first to greet you. Chances are, if any other pup came towards you, he'd shoo them away. Look more closely at the quiet fellow in the corner. You might interpret his behaviour as disinterested and aloof when he is, in fact, simply complying with pack rules. He'd love to bounce up and be made a fuss of but he knows his place, and he'll not challenge the litter's top dog. In truth, if you have small children, this more subordinate puppy may be a much better bet for you, as he's unlikely to become over-territorial or aggressive, whereas the friendlier puppy is far more susceptible to dominance problems as his true character develops. Preparing for your puppy's arrival is crucial, and here you need to look at your home in terms of denning for your latest family member. Without doubt, an indoor kennel, or puppy pen as they're more often called, will make your life an awful lot easier, and your puppy's first few days with you a lot more pleasant. To you, this may look like a cage, but to a puppy, it's his own personal space, where he can escape the hustle and bustle of his new house whenever he needs to call a timeout. If you have children small enough or curious cats, never allow them to go into the pen. This is a sanctuary for your puppy and your puppy alone. Get it right, and wherever the pen is, your puppy will feel safe and secure. Despite what some may say about starting as you mean to go on, it's perfectly okay to put the puppy pen in your bedroom for the first night. You're teaching him that the pen is where he sleeps, not your room, so consequently when you move it down to the kitchen, your puppy will readily accept this. The first night away from his mum and litter mates is quite traumatic enough without being put into solitary confinement for eight hours. If you learn nothing else from this programme, the next statement is one that you should memorise for any dog training situation that arises. The opposite of reward is not punishment. The opposite of reward is no reward. These are probably John Fisher's keynote words, stating, as he could do so very well, the obvious, 
that you would perhaps never see for yourself in a million years of pet dog training. If you watch puppies at play, they're constantly regulating each other's behaviour very effectively. Should one of the puppies play too rough or do something unacceptable, the others will not attack or reprimand, they'll simply ignore the errant dog. It doesn't take long for the shunned puppy to realise that he'd much prefer to be having fun with his litter mates than being left out in the cold. Consequently, he quickly stops the disapproved behaviour and what's more, he'll remember that this particular action caused the very undesired reaction and he probably won't repeat his misdemeanour again. From day one, you can apply this very successful instinctive method of shaping behaviour just by copying what happens within the litter. When you put your puppy in his pen the first few times, he might well bark and make a fuss. If you immediately took him out, you'd be giving yourself all sorts of problems for later because he'd learn that bad behaviour gets him what he wants. Apply the lesson of the pack and ignore him until he stops. Then you can release him when he's behaving as you would wish, reinforcing what's expected of him. Remember, ignore what you don't want and praise or reward what pleases you. This is just how it's done in the pack and it'll work equally as effectively for you. This premise will underpin every training technique you'll see in this program and we make no apology for coming back to it again and again because it really does get results. Don't expect to confine training to the puppy classes. It's ongoing and all the time. In fact, it's a crucial part of every aspect of your puppy's new way of life. So, having decided that you're going to be leader of the pack, or perhaps versed in more up-to-date doggy terms, the provider of all good things for your puppy, it's time to get down to business. First things first, your new puppy needs a name. And as you'll use it frequently, it really helps if it's one he can easily recognise. Choose a short name that can be detected above the hubbub of noise. Make sure it sounds nothing like any of the commands you intend to use to avoid any confusion. Commands need to be consistent. It's tough enough for your dog to understand English without needing a thesaurus into the bargain. Each family member needs to use the same words to express what they want your dog to do, so carefully decide matters to suit yourselves. It'll also help early on if the puppy is not bombarded with commands from all quarters. First get him used to whoever is to be viewed as the pack leader, then introduce everyone else. Lay down the ground rules and make everybody stick to them. There's nothing worse than one member of the family allowing the puppy to do what the others forbid. It's just not fair. Far from enjoying an extra treat, the puppy will get confused and into trouble. Rules need to be unfaltering and then he'll know precisely where he stands. As already mentioned earlier, your puppy will be genetically programmed to value food and a comfy place to sleep. By using the puppy pen or providing him with his own safe warm bed, you'll be giving him a place of his own in which to den down. And when he realises that this need is consistently met, he'll really relax and settle. Food in regular supply is equally as important and there's far more involved in this aspect of pet care than simply opening a can of dog food. It might sound very hard-hearted, but never let your puppy take titbits from the table. 
If it happens just once, he'll try to repeat what was a very rewarding experience. So make sure that guests as well as family members know the rules. Best of all, keep him out of any room in which humans are eating. A child safety gate can be a very good investment here, as the puppy is able to see you and not feel excluded, but can't have access to the food. Unfortunately, even an accidental spillage will reward scavenging behaviour, and the sooner your puppy learns that human food is not for him, the better, as he'll realise that he needs to quietly wait until you've finished your meal. We know from earlier that once you've eaten, you can feed your puppy to help him understand his pack ranking. However, there are a few other things to take into consideration. The choice of dog food these days is very wide, and whether you go for a dried or tinned food is entirely up to you. It's worth remembering that dogs, just like humans, can have intolerance to certain foods, so if in doubt, check with your vet. Many of the problem dog cases that John Fisher consulted on were alleviated by a change of diet, so it's always worth keeping this in mind. He did also wisely point out that dogs do not require variety in their diet. To feed the same high-quality dried food day in, day out will not bore them, and it'll consistently provide all the nutrients required. Whatever your choice of food, Put it down at the allocated feeding time, waiting for your puppy to be sitting quietly before you do so. If any food is left, make sure that you remove it, because if your puppy can come to his bowl and pick and choose when he eats, you'll be telling him that he's a very high-ranking dog indeed. It's also really important that you should be able to approach and touch your puppy's food bowl while he's eating. This establishes your right to lead your pack very firmly, because in the wild, a dog would allow a higher ranking animal to touch or even take his food, but one of lower status would be growled at and attacked if he came near. Here you see a puppy that adores cheese and his owner is establishing his right to approach the food bowl by putting in a small treat-sized morsel of cheese. The puppy will not only permit such an action, he'll actually welcome it, and with this behaviour pattern established and reinforced from time to time, it's unlikely that any food aggression problems will crop up in later life. Well, that pretty much deals with what goes into your puppy, but inevitably this means that we need to talk about what comes out. This is probably one of the most contentious issues in all dog training, because not only does it have implications for the pet's owner, if it's not handled responsibly, it affects the whole community adversely as well. Dogs are, by nature, very clean animals and will not mess within their denning area if they can possibly help it. Use this to your advantage. Teach your puppy that the whole house is just an extension of his den and provide him with a spot in the garden where he can go to the toilet. Be patient and reward him when he gets it right. He'll soon get the idea. Punishment is completely inappropriate. Your puppy will not deliberately choose to go to the toilet in the house. He'll only go to the toilet for one reason. He needs to. If he's shut in or you haven't paid heed to his warning signals, it's not his fault.
As an owner, you must take responsibility for the accident, clear it up, and remember to ensure that your dog is not left in the same circumstances again. If in doubt, pop him in his puppy pen in the kitchen with plenty of newspaper on the floor, and if there's an accident, it's quickly and easily dealt with. Now, once you've got your puppy used to his spot in the garden, you'll be able to take him to it before you set out on a walk, and if he needs to go to the toilet, he will, avoiding the need to pick up any deposits along the way. However, be prepared, and always clear up after your dog. It's a simple rule, but should be an absolute, and it's amazing how many dog owners just don't bother. You might love your puppy to bits. Others may stop and tell you how cute he is, but nobody wants to walk in what he's left behind. So clear up after him, bag it and bin it. It's a fundamental part of being a responsible dog owner. Once all your puppy's vaccinations have been completed, you really are ready to become a part of the outside world. A socially well-adjusted puppy is an absolute joy, and it's up to you as a dog owner to ensure that your puppy is never a nuisance or a danger to others. This might sound a little alarming, but if you follow the guidelines of the John Fisher way, you won't have a problem. To have control of your puppy when you step outside your front door will require him to be able to walk obediently on a lead. How many dog owners have you regularly witnessed being dragged off to the park by their pets for some daily exercise? A fair few has to be the answer, and if you're quite happy to have your arms pulled out of their sockets, fine, but there is a better way. Just like everything we've discussed so far, it's all about laying down the right foundations and thinking through your actions from the dog's point of view. But before you can think of putting a lead on your puppy, you need to get him used to wearing a collar so that you actually have something to attach the lead to. Be careful about your choice of collar. It should be extremely comfortable and here at the vet shop you know that everyone on sale is perfectly acceptable. Never use a choke chain. They're cruel and will not only cause your puppy pain, but also inflict irreparable damage to his health. And, quite rightly, your puppy, very probably, won't like you all that much. We're talking about reward-based training, where your puppy will do as you ask because it's in his interest to do so, not because he's going to experience pain if he doesn't. This type of training relies upon affection and respect, not dislike and fear, and the results have proven to be, time and again, far more effective. When your puppy's used to his collar, encourage him to walk around the house by your side. Make it a game and give him lots of praise when he keeps close to you. Then you can attach the lead and hold it loosely while he walks beside you. At first, the puppy might perceive this as a restriction, barking and making a fuss. If this happens, never take the lead off until he's become calm and quiet, because you would be giving completely the wrong signals otherwise. Your puppy will quickly learn that bad behaviour gets him nowhere, and if it's unrewarding, i.e. it doesn't get him what he wants, in this case, release from the lead, he just won't bother. This theory will also help to ensure that your dog will not attempt to pull on the lead either. In your early puppy walking days, you may find that every time the lead appears, the dog becomes noisy and gets overexcited. Should this be the case, simply put the lead away and don't get it out again until he's calm and quiet. The penny will soon drop. Here's another thought. What happens when your puppy's got his lead on, ready to go, and you open the door? Does he push past or quietly wait for you to go first? Given half a chance, it will quite naturally be the former, but you need to make sure that it's always the latter.
John Fisher explained this doggy phenomenon in terms of territorial behaviour, because doors and access points are incredibly important in pack animal terms. A puppy that's allowed to sleep in a doorway is behaving territorially as he's controlling the movements of other pack members. If you let this continue, you'll end up with unwanted dominance, so stop your puppy when he does this. It's the same instinct that'll make your dog try to push you out of the way to go through the door first, so again, you must prevent this from happening, whether on or off the lead. If he tries to barge through, just shut the door. Eventually he'll sit by your side waiting for you to make the next move. Open the door again, but just a little. If he continues to try and push past, repeat the procedure. It won't take long for him to realise what he's doing wrong, and he'll politely wait for you to go through, at which point you can make a great fuss of him and give him a reward. These are basic doggy good manners. After all, you'd expect similar good behaviour from other members of your family, and you're also gently but firmly reinforcing your right to be the pack leader. With good manners established at the front door, your puppy is not going to be exiting the house like a guided missile. It's often the case that a dog is actually pulling on the lead before he even gets outside. When you look at it from the dog's point of view, it's perfectly logical. If I pull you along, we'll get to the park, which I really like, an awful lot faster. You therefore have to teach your pet otherwise, and convince him that there's only one way to get to the park, and that's by walking properly on the lead by your side. Not only will pulling slow him down, it'll also prevent him from getting there at all, which will quickly achieve the result that you want. Try this. If your puppy pulls on the lead, stop and do absolutely nothing. After a while, realising that you're immovable by tugging, your puppy will come towards you, and by the very convenient laws of physics, the lead will go slack. As soon as the lead slackens, begin walking forwards, making it clear that progress is only made with a slack lead. If your puppy then starts pulling again, calmly repeat the procedure. You'll need to be patient. But if you make it totally unrewarding to pull on the lead, your puppy simply won't bother to do it. However, do remember that it's much easier to apply this principle to a puppy that has never pulled on a lead, rather than a fully grown dog that spent his life doing as he pleased. But it's never too late to teach an old dog new tricks. You'll just need to show even more resolve and patience, and ignore any strange looks you might get from passers-by. There's one thing that you really must take on board about walking a dog on a lead. You, as an owner, are creating an unnatural way for your dog to meet other dogs. Take a look at how two dogs greet each other when they're not on leads. They quickly work out where they stand, one taking a more submissive stance, and all is well. However, on a lead they can't do this. And if you walk towards another dog owner with animal in tow, you can get a violent reaction if you're not careful. Where possible, put the dog on your outside if another dog on a lead is approaching, because the most confrontational action pack animals could take in the wild would be to make immediate eye contact with each other. Forced on their leads to meet eye to eye, two perfectly docile pet dogs can become very aggressive and it's simply because the owners have failed to understand normal dog greeting behaviour.
when you actually reach the park, there's nothing nicer for your dog than being let off the lead. But this can never be unconditional. Until your puppy will come when you call him, it's a pleasure that you must deny him. For his own safety, your puppy must come when you call him, and the park, with all its wonderful distractions, is not the place to try and teach this. Work in your own garden and around the house, calling your puppy and rewarding him when he comes to you. Even if it takes a long time for him to respond, still reward him when he does eventually come. does a really speedy recall, try a jackpot reward. Keep a favourite toy for this, or give him a great handful of doggy treats, and he'll quickly work out that a fast response is definitely in his interest. Here's another really good tip. If every time you call your puppy, even rewarding him generously, if you then always lock him in the house and go out, you'll only encourage him to develop selective deafness. Get around this by calling him to you regularly. Make a huge fuss and reward him, and then let him go back to whatever he was doing. Inevitably, you'll come into contact with all sorts of folk when you're out and about with your puppy. And for many owners, their biggest worry is that their dog will jump up at people who stop and talk to them. It's very difficult to prevent non-doggy people from overexciting your animal, and without knowing it, they can encourage your puppy to jump up. You might understand the dog psychology now, but you're in a minority. However, there's a way to prevent jumping up. As you can see here, a fully grown dog can be quite alarming, despite the fact that he's only trying to make eye contact and lick his owner's face. John Fisher had a concisely expressed rule for avoiding jumping up, and if you put it into practice from day one, you'll not have a problem. Only ever make a fuss of your dog when he has all four paws in contact with the ground. It's so obvious, but like all the best solutions, it's almost poetic in its simplicity. You can easily explain it to friends, family and even strangers you meet on your walks, and your puppy will soon find that it's much more rewarding to keep his feet very firmly planted on the ground. On this very positive note, our programme has actually run out of time. If you follow the John Fisher way, you'll have tackled most of the causes of delinquent dog behaviour in later years and laid the foundations for a great dog's life based on mutual respect and affection. Keeping up the good work is essential, and as your relationship with your puppy develops, you can have a lot of fun with dog training. Puppy classes are a wonderful way of socialising your pet, and when you've picked up the basics, there are lots of activities you can take part in. Agility training is popular with dogs, and owners for that matter, of all ages, and you can even dance with your dog if you have a mind to. Good girl. Good 
John Fisher had many more wise words to impart than we've had time to cover in this programme. And if you'd like to know more, do search out his well-written, witty books. Because not only will you learn how to get the very best out of living with a pet dog, you'll also enjoy a really good read as well. Very Okay. Socialization. Yes, we do. We went to the Oh, Abba. Oh, good. Good, Abba. Okay, very good. And to get her to stand, we show her a tidbit and we bring it away. And when she does stand, good, Abba. Good, Abba. And we need to make sure that she does that every time we do a hand move and lay down. Now, a dog of this size, if we start physically pushing him down, he's obviously going to resist and we're going to strain our muscles a little bit. So we're going to... Uh, and this is the help of this And of course, we couldn't finish our programme without allowing John Fisher the last word. So here's one of John's delightful anecdotes, told in his own unique style from Diary of a Dotty Dog Doctor. <music> Miss Gort was a very frail lady in her late 60s or early 70s. She'd made the appointment to come and see me in Surrey because her dog was aggressive to people it didn't know. Not an unusual case, except Rudy, as her dog was called, was a massive male Rottweiler, and on top of that, he didn't know me. I heard her car pull up on our shingle car park and gave her a few minutes before going out to meet her. As I arrived in the car park, I was met by the sight of a spitting, frothing, snarling beast of a dog, who, although we hadn't met before, had obviously heard of me and had the full intention of showing me that I'd met my match at last. The only thing stopping me from experiencing Rudy's rotty wrath was a lead wrapped around an elderly lady's wrist, who, in turn, was desperately trying to hang on to the tailgate of her car. As we were on icy shingle, she was having a job to keep on her feet, and there was absolutely no way she could let go of the car with me stood there. Rudy was not bluffing. Drawing on all my years of experience, I very quickly diagnosed that this was not a good scene and decided to go to the office and let her follow me later. Over the noise that Rudy was making, I told her to follow the fence down the drive and that my office was the converted end stable. I resisted the urge to make my usual comment that there are two stables in the world where miracles happen and the other was in Jerusalem even though I thought it would be a miracle if I didn't get bitten that day. By making sure that I was in the office first, Rudy would be coming onto my territory instead of me invading his. This had obviously added to his anger because I'd approached his car. I was hoping, no, I was praying that this might take some of the sting out of the temper tantrum I'd just witnessed. My wife told me later that she'd feared for my safety when she watched Miss Gort slowly make her way to my office. She grabbed a fence post and regained her balance before making a lunge for the next post. This procedure got her down the drive. To get past the stables, she grabbed the doorframe of each open top door. Rudy weighed in at around 120 pounds and she weighed around 90. The pair eventually burst through my doorway and Rudy looked at me as if to say, oh, it's you again, is it? I thought you'd run away once. My ploy had worked, though. He was marginally calmer. 
Since seeing Rudy all those years ago, my office has been extended to twice the size, and I now have very firmly secured hooks on the walls. On this day, I was in a room 12 feet by 12 feet with 120 pounds of angry Rottweiler and only a frail old lady as an anchor point. I remember thinking, Remind me again, John, why do I do this for a living? Having got seated, Rudy calmed down a bit, but he never once took his eyes off me. I actually like Rottweilers and don't believe they deserve the reputation that often goes before them, but they do have an unnerving ability to fix you with an expressionless stare. I avoided eye contact with him and proceeded to subtly try and establish why such an elderly lady would want to own a dog of this size and sheer power. To cut a long and very frightening consultation short, Miss Gort had been the housekeeper for a retired army officer. He'd recently died and in his will he'd left Rudy to her care with a large amount of money to ensure that he got the best of everything. She was obeying his instructions and feeding Rudy on the best cuts of raw meat that money could buy. Among a variety of other problems that we needed to deal with, this dog was out of his head on raw meat protein and a totally unbalanced diet. At one point, Miss Gort was sat on the edge of a leather-covered settee, holding on to Rudy's lead with both hands. I stood up to make us both a cup of coffee, and Rudy lunged at me, dumping Miss Gort unceremoniously face down on her knees and elbows, but she managed to hang on to the lead. We were in a stalemate situation. I was trapped in a corner with Rudy's hot breath almost in my face and with Miss Gort hanging on for grim death but unable to get up. I started praying for the second time that day because I was absolutely certain that Rudy had not rushed over to help with the coffee cups. After what seemed like an eternity, my wife walked past the open top door, which distracted Rudy sufficiently for me to escape. The slippery leather city has since been changed. I've seen a lot of angry dogs since that day and had a lot of hairy moments, but none have compared to my meeting with Rudy. Without doubt, it was the most frightening consultation I've ever conducted. A last comment. Rudy responded very well and very quickly to a variety of procedures which we put into place a head collar for greater control and to save Miss Gort's arms from being ripped off her body. Some of the money was used to employ an experienced dog walker and trainer to give Rudy more off-territory exercise and greater mental stimulation. More importantly, he was put on a well-balanced diet and this produced almost immediate improvement. Without doubt, diet is a major player where aggressive behaviour is concerned, although at the time of writing, there's no scientific evidence to back up my statement. Horse people have known about the diet behaviour link for years, and for that matter, so have boxers. When boxers prepare for title fights, they eat a predominantly meat diet. It gives them the fizz needed to keep the aggression going. Perhaps Frank Bruno should have eaten American beef before his Tyson fight, not British.